Okay, now what you want. Um, I'm Alan Meadows over the Baker Institute, and I'm uh, very pleased to welcome everybody to this event tonight, which is very special to me, and I hope it's going to be special to you because our speaker is Osama Mactasi, who's been a colleague of mine for more than 20 years. When I, I first came to Rice in the early 1960s, the History Department offered courses only in U.S. history and Western Europe. We were the greatest power in the world, and so the assumption was they had to learn about us, but we really didn't have to learn about them. Since then, uh, we had a revolution in our curriculum. We have two experts on Latin American history department, one on Mexico, one in Brazil. We have African history. We have uh, a historian of Islam. We have Jewish history. We have South Asian history. We teach China. We have a scholar of Japan. Uh, so we are now a global history department. We have Arab history uh, in part because of a generous gift we got from the Arab American Educational Foundation, which is located here in Houston. And if any members of that uh, uh, foundation are here today, thank you very much for that gift. The first holder of the chair that uh, the foundation endowed, and so far the only holder, is Usama Maktasi. Uh, we um, recruited him fresh out of Princeton. He got his PhD there in 1997. And um, in the ensuing 20 years, he has become a leader uh, in his field of Arab history and has had a, a, an exceptionally distinguished career as a historian. I don't have time to, to go through all of his honors and achievements, but I'll, I'll give a, 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 a few of them because they uh, are evidence of what a distinguished academic career looks like. In 2018, he won the Berlin Prize, which is actually an invitation to a series of distinguished scholars to spend a semester in residence at the American Academy of Berlin. He was invited by a program at the Sorbonne to spend May of 2010. He was a Carnegie Scholar, he was a visiting scholar of Middle Eastern studies at Harvard for a year. He's got uh, uh, grants from the American Council of Learned Societies, the fellowship of Woodrow Wilson, a fellowship from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, and uh, an Andrew Mellon postdoctoral fellowship. These are the, the premier granting agencies uh, in the United States for academics. In the meantime, he turned out um, a, a, um, a long series of, of scholarly articles, including two in the leading uh, journal in the United States, the American Historical Review, and also in the Journal of American History. And uh, in the meantime, he taught. Uh, he is an engaged scholar, he has a point of view, but his teaching is fair-minded, and that is testified by the teaching, prestigious teaching award that he received a few years ago. In the end, a distinguished academic career depends on the books you write, and Usama has written four books. The first of them was um, The Culture of Sectarianism, Community, History, and Violence in 19th Century Ottoman Lebanon. Um, this is a, a book about um, Lebanon from 1840 to 1861 when the stable Ottoman order was destabilized um, by reformers in the Ottoman Empire, by imperialist inter inter interveners, and by local actors. Uh, it culminated in 1860 in a massacre in Damascus of Muslims against Christians and it produced in 1861 uh, the beginnings of the modern Lebanon state. Lebanon got autonomy uh, and uh, religious communities uh, were politicized and it began the sectarian politics 
that is still characteristic of Lebanon today. Um, his second book was called The Artillery of Heaven, American Missionaries and the Failed Conquest of the Middle East, Cornell, uh, 2008. This is a really fascinating book. It was extremely widely reviewed. I've never encountered a negative review of this book. It's about American missionaries uh, in uh, uh, Lebanon in, um, uh, from 1820 to 1840. These are um, inspired uh, American uh, uh, Puritan missionaries who go there uh, blinded by their, uh, their cultural arrogance to the reality of the world in which they so badly failed. Uh, one of the interesting points of this book is um, uh, some, uh, takes pains to say, look, this is, this is not a story of the collision of civilizations, the clash of civilizations. You could read it that way, but it's not. If you go into the particulars, it's quite a different story. And it's part of his general position that the clash of civilization theories isn't, is entirely wrong. His next book was called Faith Misplaced, The Broken Promises of U.S.-Arab Relations, 1820 to 2001. Um, this, this book uh, is a history of um, the American image in the Arab world and uh, how America served as a beacon of hope for that world and how post-World World War II foreign policy broke those hopes. And the fourth book, which is why we're assembled here today, just recently published, is called The Age of Coexistence, The Ecumenical Frame and the Making of the, of the Modern Arab World. This is an extremely bold and ambitious book. It has many messages and many layers, but one of them is to deconstruct the American idea that the sectarian conflict in the Arab world, violent conflict between religious communities, that conflict does not have its origin, is his argument, in ancient and immutable conflicts. They are part of a historical process and historical contingencies. Um, Hussam is an engaged scholar. He, his, his historical interests grow out of his contemporary uh, concerns. I think uh, it's not fair to say that um, what animates his work is a belief that the ideal polity is one in which all citizens have equal rights and there is coexistence among, um, among religious communities. So today, what's going to happen is that Usama is going to talk about his book, Age of Coexistence, The Making of the Modern Arab World. He's gonna talk about 45 minutes, but he can talk as much as he wants. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of questions. And if you're interested in this subject, and I suspect you will be, um, the book will be on sale at, at the rear of the auditorium. Usama will sign some books and um, you may in fact want to buy one. So I hope that you will join me in welcoming to the platform a man who has been my colleague and he's been a teacher of mine and he is a friend of mine, Usama Makdisi. Thank you so much, um, Professor Madiso Allen, for that really generous introduction. I was told I'm not allowed to shake your hand, and so um, I won't, but I, I am really grateful uh, for that truly moving, genuine um, introduction by, by a colleague who has taught me and inspired me by his teaching and by his fair-mindedness, even if I don't agree with everything. <laughs> Alan writes, but, but still, a true colleague um, and a generous one, so thank you. And thank you, of course, uh, as well to Ambassador Jerigian and to the Baker Institute and the staff at the Baker Institute, including um, Colton Cox and several uh, others, many, uh, actually, a few who uh, have been my students, so I'm very grateful uh, to their work uh, and their help 
in making this happen. And of course, I am deeply grateful to each and every one of you for coming out this evening in the circumstances. Um, I, I do appreciate it. To talk about a book, um, which as Alan described, is about, is essentially a history of an attempt to shift the debate about how we think about the modern Arab world, to think about the modern Arab world as a place of, of uh, profound um, beauty in some ways, profound coexistence, um, and to do it in a critical manner without emphasizing, um, without denying, in other words, the problems, but by emphasizing all that is, all that is um, constructive. So the very first sentence of my book starts, every history of sectarianism is also a history of coexistence. So my new book opens with this sentence, to stress what I feel is a point that cannot be stressed enough. There is no question, as Alan just mentioned, that sectarian antagonisms are evident across a region that we routinely refer to as a war-torn region. Sort of that, and that phrase, a war-torn region, troubles me profoundly because, of course, it naturalizes the idea that violence is endemic to the Arab world. But it's also clear to me, I mean, so I don't deny that there are sectarian issues, and we can talk about those later, and in the book I do talk about them. But it's also very clear to me that for those of us who are willing to look at the Arab world and the Arab peoples with complexity, with an open mind and heart, that there is also in this region a profound tradition of anti-sectarian solidarities that have been evident for anyone who's willing, as I say, to look at this region. So there may be sectarianism, there is sectarianism, but there's also anti-sectarianism. And these have been apparent from the, how do I move, is it this way? These have been apparent from, uh, in the 19th century, they're apparent at the beginning of the 20th century, whether we're talking about the radical Coptic Christian priest, Sergius, who preached anti-colonialism during the uh, 1919 Egyptian uprising against the British, and this is a Coptic priest who preached anti-colonialism from Al-Azhar, which is the great Muslim seminary in Cairo. Or, as you see at the bottom picture, the millions of men and women who've been protesting against corrupt sectarian politics in uh, Lebanon, this picture, but also in Iraq. In other words, there has been, throughout the 20th century, and in fact going all the way back, as I explain in my book, in the 19th century, a modern ecumenical anti-sectarian consciousness in the Arab world. And in particular, as Alan again mentioned, uh, my, my book, my, I try in my book to dispute two ways and two stories that have dominated the question of religious difference in the Middle East. The first story is one that most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, which is to say the ubiquitous Western media and policy representation of the Arab world as a place that is torn and that is consumed by pathological sectarian strife between allegedly and perpetually sectarian antagonistic religious communities. So that's one story, the sectarian Middle East, and we hear this term over and over again to the point where it's become a commonplace. The second story that I push back against is the idea that it's, it's a less mischievous story, it's a less, I think, damaging story, but it's also an ahistorical story, and that is the idea that in the Middle East there's also perpetual coexistence as toleration. In other words, I don't want to romanticize the Middle East, nor, of course, do I want to and do I accept in any way, shape, or form demonizing the Arab world. So then, how to proceed? The way I try in my book, and in contrast to these two narratives, age-old sectarianism, age-old coexistence, both ahistorical, I am interested, as I've tried to explain in the book, in a modern anti-sectarian story. In other words, to ask how and why, and this is what I try to do in the book, coexistence as a form of modern, conscious, ecumenical solidarity between Muslims, Christians, and for a period, Jews, in the Middle East, went from being unimaginable at the beginning of the 19th century to unremarkable by the middle of the 20th century. In other words, how it is it that ecumenical compatriotship, the idea of solidarity between Muslim and non-Muslim, went from being unthinkable at the beginning of the 19th century, when such ideas were not current in the Middle East or in any other part of the world for that matter, how it went from that to 
actually being imaginable and then unremarkable, and then of course, profoundly, tragically, terribly today, it's being questioned, this very idea, can people in the Middle East coexist? So I'm the first to admit that the term coexistence is a much abused and imperfect one. Most of us, I think, in Houston encounter it as a bumper sticker. It's something you see at the back of cars, uh, a call, a quite a vapid call, I mean, understandably a nice call, for toleration between the three monotheistic faiths. The term more generally can signify, I think, a nostalgic appreciation of the broad sweep of the Islamic past, whether we're talking about Andalusia, or whether we're talking about Abbas at Baghdad, where Jewish and Christian communities famously were said to have thrived under Islamic rule. But the term coexistence can be deployed, uh, can be deployed excuse me, far more insidiously. For example, just a few weeks ago, Jared Kushner invoked the term coexistence in his, what I see as a profoundly cruel plan uh, or vision of perpetual Israeli domination over the Palestinians. But at its best, the study of coexistence tracks the will to harmonize religious and ethnic difference in the modern Arab world, even if this aspiration to harmonize difference has been consistently belied by politics and by the discordant sounds and structures of coexistence itself. So to talk coexistence, about coexistence meaningfully as a modern condition, we must distinguish between the long and variable history of communities that have lived side by side before the principles of secular equality and citizenship and compatriotship uh, were introduced into the world, in other words, before the 19th century, and after these principles were enshrined in the modern era. We must also distinguish between coexistence as a state of being, in which individuals or communities merely exist together in various conditions and epochs, to coexistence as a modern consciousness where people of different faiths and ethnicities choose to become compatriots when other options have beckoned, such as racial separation, separatism, minoritarianism, or ethno-religious nationalism. So the beauty of coexistence as a modern condition is something that people think about and act on in the conditions of uh, the possibility of equal citizenship and equality. Having acknowledged this fundamental difference between pre-modern and modern conditions of coexistence, we also need to push back, as Alan mentioned, I've tried to do this for a while, against the ubiquitous representation of the Middle East and especially of the Arab world as a pathologically sectarian place. To be clear, communal identifications exist, but they also change for anyone who studied them constantly. Sectarianism, moreover, can indicate religious and doctrinal conflicts between Protestants and Catholics, between Presbyterians and Methodists, between Sunnis and Shi'is, and so on and so forth. That is to say, we could use the term sectarianism just to think about doctrinal differences and religious conflicts that take us back centuries. But in the Arab world, sectarianism, a ta'ifiya, the Arabic word, means something quite different. It refers to a modern problem of political partisanship along sectarian or ethnic lines that unfairly and unequally distribute resources in an era of secular equality and citizenship. In other words, there can be no understanding of sectarianism in the modern Arab world without thinking about the problem of nation states and equality. Anyone who has lived in the Arab world, of course, and many of us, of course, have lived there, know that stubborn sectarian realities and problems exist in countries such as Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Bahrain, and so on. Just as anyone who lives in the United States, as all of us do here, will likewise perceive an obvious racial problem in this country. This does not mean that sectarianism is the same as racism, nor that the historical experience of Sunnis, Shias, Christians, and Jews in the Arab world is the same as that of Latinos, Anglos, and African Americans in the United States. What it means, rather, is understanding how different modern communal, racial, and sectarian formations, and just as importantly, different anti-racist, anti-communalist, and anti-sectarian commitments were common legacies and problems of a global 19th century political revolution. This revolution introdu introduced, as I've said, the profoundly important and historic principle of political equality among citizens, many of whom had been historically and legally classified as inferior in centuries past in very different circumstances and contexts. 
What is manifestly clear, to me at least, is that this revolution, the introduction of the idea of political equality, was deeply contested in every part of the world, including the United States and in Europe. I will elaborate about this point in a moment, using the example also of the Ottoman Empire, which became the first Islamic polity in history to formally acknowledge the equality of Muslim and non-Muslim subjects in the 1850s, and then enshrined it constitutionally in 1876. And this empire, the Ottoman Empire, abolished a range of formal and centuries-old markers of non-Muslim inferiority in its domains in the middle to late 19th century. This rollback, this Ottoman rollback of overt discrimination against non-Muslims, inadvertently and ironically, unleashed a new sectarian question. If the empire was no longer a sultanate of privileged Muslims ideologically and legally, what then was the relationship between religious difference and a modernizing sovereign state that claimed to be non-discriminatory and civilized? And what to make of the fact that as the Ottomans were reforming their empire, and this was a hugely difficult, contested, and controversial process, what to make of the fact that as the Ottomans were reforming their empire in a secular direction, in other words, transforming the meaning of what it means to be Ottoman from being exclusively Muslim to being open to all subjects of the empire, irrespective of the religious affiliations. What to make of this, this reformation in a secular direction um, while halfway, not halfway actually, on the other side of the world in California, where I'm teaching this semester, in 1862, that state's Supreme Court upheld the non-admissibility of black, Native American, and Asian testimony against white settlers. My point is that the emergence of modern national questions across the Ottoman Empire that came to haunt, as I'll explain, the relationship between Muslim and non-Muslim in the 19th century unfolded during a 19th century when religious and racial differences were powerfully recast by new notions of secular equality emancipation and citizenship. I'll try to explain, this may be complicated, but let me try to explain. Here in Texas, and in fact across the US South, Jim Crow segregation was justified as separate but equal, and followed the end, of course, of radical reconstruction. We should recall that racial anti-Semitism emerged in France, Austria, and Germany after the formal emancipation of European Jews. That apartheid was a mid 20th century project in South Africa that was justified by its proponents, of course I'm not justifying any of these things, but that was justified by its proponents as quote, civilized rule fitted to the separate, allegedly separate racial development of whites and blacks. And then in the name of Jewish self-determination, Israel today oversees an egregious system of domination that privileges Jewish citizens over non-Jews in the occupied Palestinian lands. I say all this not to be polemical. I'm not trying to be polemical. I'm trying to make a point. My point is that political equality has never been, never been a noble principle that spreads from the West to the rest of the world. Rather, its introduction everywhere, including in the Ottoman Empire and in the Middle East and in the Arab world, but also in the US and in Europe and everywhere else, has been deeply contested, has been ambivalent, has been exclusionary, has been incomplete, but in quite different ways because of different contexts. Put differently, the struggle for true emancipation, let alone for social justice, is everywhere a constant and ongoing struggle. And I think that should be clear to us today here, as it is, of course, to people in the Arab region itself. So to my specific um, argument, the modern culture of coexistence that I'm interested in, there is no question that it did constitute a major ideological and political departure from an older model of Ottoman uh, imperial uh, Muslim sovereignty or privilege, or a system rather of cascading unequal privileges dispensed unilaterally from the will of an absolutist Muslim sultan, the head of the Ottoman Empire, to uh, different communities under his sovereign will. The 19th century, in other words, this was a Muslim empire that ruled over non-Muslim subjects, as well as, of course, Muslim subjects, and there was no equality at all before the 19th century. The 19th century witnessed, as you can see, maybe make out from this map, 
the 19th century witnessed the systematic breakdown of this long-standing and profoundly unequal Ottoman imperial system that had ruled for centuries over a vast multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and multi-linguistic landscape. This breakdown inevitably opened the ideological and political space for new political imaginations and horizons and vocabularies, some of which were more inclusive and some far less so. If it's too much to say that the Ottomans were, co were colonized in the 19th century by great European powers, there is no question for anyone who's a student of the Ottoman Empire that Ottoman sovereignty was severely and serially diminished. And you just look at this map, you can get a sense of how systematic were the losses from the 18th century all the way through the 19th century and into the 20th century. For example, the Greek War of Independence between 1821 and 1830, which European powers supported, saw the Ottomans lose a significant part of their empire. The war saw Muslims forced out of what would become the Kingdom of Greece, and in return saw savage reprisals against Christian subjects in places such as Ivalik and Chios. The Ottoman Sultan even authorized the hanging of the Greek Patriarch of Istanbul on Easter Sunday, 1821. This was an extraordinary act, an extraordinarily terrifying and terrible act. But it reflected not so much Ottoman, um, age-old Ottoman tyranny, as much as a moment of revolution and a response, a counter-revolution, a response to this revolution that was totally discordant with the tenor of traditional Ottoman imperial coexistence and discrimination that in different ways and with different intensities affected dress, architecture, forms of address, and sociability across the Ottoman Islamic Empire. So my point is to clarify, between 1839 and 1876, which is a period that Ottoman scholars know as the Tanzimat, or the Reformation of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman sultans, under enormous European pressure and after the Greek War of Independence, when Greece became independent from the Ottomans, um, decreed, the Ottoman sultans decreed for the first time non-discrimination between Muslim and non-Muslim in their empire. The Ottoman sultans also conceded a free trade treaty with Britain, and they committed to maintaining whatever privileges had accrued to non-Muslim communities, the Christian churches in particular, um, the Armenian and the Greek churches, uh, that, these, that these churches had accrued over centuries. From its outset then, the invocation and implementation of non-discrimination was never free from bias. In other words, many Muslim subjects in the empire viewed the ending of Islamic privilege as a concession at a time of aggressive Western secular and missionary assault on the lands of the Ottomans. Ottoman Muslims were also conscripted far more intensively than Ottoman non-Muslims. In other words, at the very moment where the Ottoman state said we're no longer discriminating against non-Muslims, at that same moment, conscription of Muslims increased dramatically. European imperialism increased dramatically. European and American missionary movements increased dramatically. All these affected and shaped the meaning of non-discrimination in the Ottoman 19th century and inevitably led to controversy, pushback, and resentment. The example that I use in the book to talk about this resentment is this massacre that takes place in Damascus in, 19, in 1860 that Alan alluded to, which was the largest single massacre of Christians that took place in, the Ottoman, in Ottoman Syria in 400 years of Ottoman rule over the Syrian provinces. On 9 July 1860, a few days after the last slave ship to cross the Atlantic unloaded its cargo of enslaved Africans off the coast of Alabama, a Muslim mob turned furiously on the Christians of Damascus. The Christian quarter of the city was devastated. Hundreds of Christian subjects were killed and homes, shops, and churches were looted. And this picture to your left um, is a picture taken by the Prince of Wales' retinue when he visited Damascus um, after the massacre. Western missionaries and Orientalist scholars at the time, in other words in 1860, fixated on this moment, because it was a terrible massacre, to insist that this massacre and this Muslim turning on the Christians of Damascus was evidence, they said, of Islam's alleged incompatibility with modern civilization. 
and they pointed to the massacre to say, this is proof. What more do you need? More recently, of course, scholars have emphasized the economic and the material dimensions of the anti-Christian riots in an era in which, as I mentioned, Muslim subjects were both deprivileged and conscripted as never before. Whatever the actual reasons for the riots, they did underscore the huge difficulty that the Ottoman state had in elaborating what it meant and what was implied by secular equality of citizens in a reforming 19th century polity. How, in other words, do you reconcile previous forms of discrimination with new edicts of non-discrimination and equality? And unlike the Orientalist scholars who fixate on Islam's alleged incompatibility with modern civilization, we should just bear in mind that this was occurring at roughly the same time as the US Civil War, and of course, as many bouts of anti-black race rioting occurred in this country. So in other words, the sectarian crisis that unfolded in the Ottoman Empire paralleled other crises unfolding in other parts of the world, including in this country. Without saying that these are all the same, because they're not the same, different histories, different contexts, but the point is keep in mind a global perspective. More to the point, to shift to the man on the, uh, the right of the, of the picture. The cataclysm, the sectarian cataclysm, in other words, there was violence in 1860, produced more than simply sectarian antagonisms, fears, anxieties of the sectarian other. It also precipitated, and this is something scholars have not actually emphasized enough, an urgent search for an alternative form of coexistence in the context of the reforming Ottoman Empire and in the context of ever more apparent Western encroachment. Take, for example, the 11 epistles um, that were printed anonymous, anonymously, actually they were printed by this man, Butlus um, in between October 18, in other words, after the massacres of 1860, all the way through 1861. There are 11 epistles, 11 pamphlets. At the same time as Europeans and Ottoman statesmen had come to Syria to divide up Syria to figure out how to deal with the, with the sectarian violence. Now what's interesting about these pamphlets that this man authored is that they're called the Clarion of Syria, in Arabic, Nafir Suriya. They were signed by Muhibl al-Watan, in other words, a patriot. And what's amazing about these pamphlets is that they described, they're the first usage of the term civil war uh, to describe the sectarian cataclysm of 1860. In other words, the point that Bustani was making in these pamphlets was that all the people of Syria breathe the same air um, and live on the same land and speak the same language. They were all, as he said, sons of Adam, brothers and compatriots. In other words, he was trying to tell people, don't go down the dark sectarian path, go down the other path, the more rational, the more enlightened path. Now, Bustani himself was a convert from Maronite Christianity to Protestantism. He was a printer at the American press in Beirut, which was at the time a booming multi-religious port city, and it was a center of trade and foreign missions and consulates. And Bustani, in fact, until today, this man remains um, an iconic figure of what in Arabic is known as the Renaissance of Arabic or the Mahda, uh, which is to say sort of the, 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 the affirmation, the self-affirmation in Arabic of Arabs, of their history, of their culture, and of the possibility of their autonomous agency and development. The most striking aspect of Bustani's pamphlets, in other words, is that he understood perfectly well that in the aftermath of the massacres of 1860, many of his compatriots were going to go down, as I said, the sectarian path. And he said precisely, there is a different way. There is a possibility of ecumenical compatriotship, but we have to work at it. In other words, I can't say and I can't claim and I don't in the book claim that Bustani's appeal to an enlightened ecumenical compatriotship or patriotism was more important than sectarian fears or more natural than sectarian fears or animosities stoked by the events of 1860. Yet precisely because these fears existed and because the fate of Eastern Christians, as Bustani understood, had become a central justification of Western interventionism in the Orient, it was all the more urgent, he felt, to appreciate the actual need for an anti-sectarian development, pedagogy, new schools 
new approaches to the past and the present to instill in compatriots the idea that people in Syria, as in the rest of the East, can in fact and have to be greater than the sum of their communal parts. So Bustani then opens the first ecumenical modern national school in the Ottoman Empire, which he called the National School. And he was recognized by the Ottoman state, and you can tell by just looking at this portrait of him, the only portrait we have, where he's wearing the fez, which was an Ottoman um, uh, um, introduction in the 19th century, which signified a secular Ottoman, um, it could be Muslim, it could be Christian, it could be Jewish, the fez that today we think of as an old thing, but at the time was considered a sign of civilization. And if you look at his chest, he's got this major Ottoman medallion pinned to his chest because the Ottoman state formally acknowledged his school, the work he did, and blessed his work to create a, a national uh, sense of compatriotship. And by national is not nationalist. It's not meant nationalist. By national, Bustani meant specifically the coming together of men and women of different faiths in schools across Syria, Palestine, and Mount Lebanon under an Ottoman rubric. In other words, religion was fundamentally part of a way of thinking about the future. So the way to build a common Ottoman future was to acknowledge religious difference, not to abolish religious difference, and to say that Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and the different forms of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism can together become the building blocks of a common transcendent overarching Syrian, Arab, or Ottoman nation. And he went to work, and he was recognized by the state for this work. And he's often introduced, misleadingly, as a Christian secularist, who is said to have preceded other famous Christian Arabs, such as Amin Hani, George Antonius, Edward Said, and so on. But Bustani never refers to himself in these pamphlets as a Christian. He only refers to himself as a patriot. And he's specific about this. Because I think we miss the point if we think of him only as a Christian, rather than as someone who was committed to the idea of ecumenical compatriotship with Muslim and Jewish and other Christian compatriots. And so there, there is something quite profound about Bustani's work and the fact that his work was blessed by the Ottoman state. And in fact, rather than thinking of Bustani as simply mimicking Western secularism, What's amazing about Bustani is that he anticipated the coalescence after 1860, into the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, into the 1900s, a, an explosion of self-consciously didactic, ecumenical, secular, and pietistic journalists, doctors, government employees, engineers, teachers, and religious scholars, all of whom grappled with this question of how is it that we're going to elaborate what it means to be Arab or Syrian or Egyptian or Ottoman and at the same time acknowledge and recognize religious difference. What's amazing about this is not only that you had Christians like Bustani and Muslims and Jews in the Ottoman context who were working on this, they didn't agree inevitably. But what's amazing is that for them, for each of these people, the great other was not the religious other. In other words, it's not that the Muslims saw the Christian as the other or that the Christians saw the Muslim as the other. The other for all these people was the ignorant person who didn't understand, in their view, what, quote, true religion was and what true civilization was. In other words, the sectarian problem, insofar as it existed, was a pedagogical problem. It wasn't about hating others. And I think this is the point that I try to emphasize in the book in very different ways. So you had Muslims, you had Christians, you had Jews, you had people who were secular, people who were pietistic, all of whom were trying to figure out how is it that we can elaborate what it means to be an Ottoman, a Syrian, a compatriot. So I call this modern commitment to coexistence that developed in very diverse ways. So you can't read Arabic, most of you probably won't read Arabic, but those of you who can will understand. On the far right, your far right, is the most famous Islamic journal of, of the Ottoman period and the post-Ottoman period, Al-Manar. The middle one is Al-Mashrit, which is an ultra-Catholic journal. Uh, and then Bustani's pamphlets, is, there's an example of Bustani's more secular pamphlet. So there was no agreement about how and where to sort of emphasize religion and where to emphasize secular uh, ideas. I mean, there was a constant, like in any society, there was a tremendous debate. There was tremendous diversity within the, 
within this sort of new form of coexistence, but there was that debate. And my point is ultimately that this was a flourishing debate that occurred in the Ottoman period, in the late 19th century, all the way until the end of the Ottoman era. I call this modern form of coexistence the ecumenical frame. And I'll try to explain what this phrase means. I'm adapting, of course, a Greek concept, the ecumene, which means the whole of the inhabited earth. And I'm aware, of course, that in more contemporary usage, the term ecumenical refers to the emphasis on the common underlying fundamentals of belief in order to transcend sectarian differences. In other words, one speaks today of a modern Christian ecumenical movement between different Protestants, for example, or we speak of modern Islamic ecumenism, in other words, those who are trying to bridge the gap between Sunnis and Shias. I'm adapting this term ecumenical to mean the modern efforts to promote, to promote social and political equality and to overcome the communal divides in the Middle East. So I'm broadening the conventional usage and secularizing it. By ecumenical, I mean the ability and the will and the efforts on the part of Muslim, Christian, Jewish, secular and pietistic compatriots in the 19th century to build a political society greater than the sum of their sectarian parts and the belief that they could do so on their own, with their own agency and through their own agency. In other words, I try to show in the book how the very idea of true religion was elaborated in the 19th century and the opposite of true religion was not Christianity or Islam or Judaism. It was, as I said, the ignorant and fanatical people who do not understand that true religion, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, or Islam, all can be the basis of a common Ottoman uh, patriotism. And it's the term sectarianism that we use today so cavalierly. This term originates in this moment, and in fact is only elaborated actually formally in the 20th century, to mean specifically the opposite of national unity in the Arab world. So by frame, so that's what ecumenical. Ecumenical just means the idea that people can work together and emphasize what binds them together and how they can transcend their differences without denying those differences. And by frame, as an ecumenical frame, I'm talking about the structure, the politics, the law. In other words, the Ottoman Empire that was reforming itself because without the Ottoman Empire's reformation, without the idea of a state saying equality and citizenship are part and parcel of how we organize society, there could not have been this movement. People depended on the state, just as we still do today, and on laws. So in the book, I follow not only the Ottoman and Western structures, empire, colonialism, law, politics, all of which were key factors in the development of the ecumenical frame, but also the contending agency of secular and pietistic Muslim and non-Muslim Arabs who were crucial in living, legitimating, and of course contesting the nature of the ecumenical frame. There is and there were and there remain major differences just as there are in this society between those who want a more Islamic society, those who want a more secular society, those who want to be Christian minorities, and so on and so forth. But in the context of an Ottoman state that was committed legally and ideologically after the mid-19th century to the idea of secular citizenship, the ecumenical frame was built and was consolidated and was contested. And this continued all the way until the end of the 19th century. And what's interesting is that while the Arab provinces uh, of the Ottoman Empire in the Mashriq and the Arab East, places that we today call Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, these areas that were all at the time under Ottoman sovereignty, while the ecumenical frame was developing and the idea of coexistence and ecumenical compatriotship under an Ottoman frame was developing in the 19th century into the 20th century, at the same time in the northern parts of the empire, in the Balkans, in Anatolia itself, a very different problem was developing. That is to say, there, beginning with the Greek War of Independence, but continuing with the Serbian Wars and continuing with the Balkan Wars of the late 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, there was a problem of ethno-religious nationalism that flourished in the Balkan parts of the empire. So the northern parts of the empire developed ethno-religious nationalisms which separated Muslim from Christian. In the Arab provinces, under Ottoman sovereignty, no matter how diminished, how limited, how problematic, 
there was no national question, no nationalist, I should say, separation. There was no uh, major secessionist movement against the Ottomans. And their Arab subjects, whether they were Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, could in fact thrive. And so what's amazing, and scholars, I don't think I've appreciated this enough, is that in the northern part of the empire, as Greece became independent, Serbia became independent, Bulgaria became independent, Muslims were basically forced out. And then in retaliation or in dialectic with that, Ottoman Muslim nationalism developed, which then excluded Armenians and Greeks, which is why the Armenian question develops in the late 19th century and why the Armenian genocide occurs during the First World War. Not in the 18th century, not the 17th century, not the 16th century, not the 15th century, but in the late modern era. So while the Armenians are being persecuted in the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century, Arab Christians are thriving, all under a single Ottoman rule. Why is that? Well, because of the ecumenical frame, because of a common Arabic language, because the Ottoman state faced very different pressures in the southern Arab provinces than it faced in the northern provinces, because of the lack of a secessionist movement on the part of Arab Christians, uh, because of the nature of European imperial, there are many different reasons, but my point is that we have to bear in mind that the Arab provinces and this idea of ecumenical Arab compatriotship in its most generous term thrived in an Ottoman period while Armenian Christians and Greek Christians eventually were stigmatized and minoritized. It's important to bear these in mind. And while Muslim subjects in the Balkans were expelled en masse in the 19th century. So it's a bit complicated, but you just have to bear this wider picture in mind. And so this is the story. And this story develops and flourishes and goes all the way until the end of the Ottoman Empire. And when the Ottoman Empire collapsed in, at the end of the First World War, there was a very different, um, uh, a very different sort of um, trajectory develops. And the reason I say that is because this Arab ecumenical trajectory under this modern form of coexistence that developed initially in an Ottoman auspices was suddenly confronted with a new post-Ottoman world, a world that was dominated not by Ottomans, who had been defeated, nor by Arabs, but by Europeans who colonized this region at the end of the First World War. And it's a point that many of us know. We hear the phrase, some of us who are scholars, we've heard of the phrase sex because uh, we've, we know about the mandate system, which is to say the, the way the League of Nations dominated by Britain and France, partitioned the former Ottoman Empire. We know these phrases, but what we don't, I think, recognize sufficiently enough is that this mandate system was not only the, among the last forms of colonialism in the world, it was also the first colonialism in the name of self-determination. In other words, President Wilson issued this famous, actually Lenin did, but also Wilson, uh, they both issued these ideas, or they both talked about self-determination. Uh, and the Arab world was colonized by the European powers in the name of self-determination. The British and French partition, and you just look at this, was all one Ottoman region where there was an Arab form of coexistence flourishing under Ottoman auspices with all those tremendous differences within these things. I don't want to sort of in any way diminish the differences and the tensions and the anxieties and the elisions and the taboos. But while all that was happening, it was nevertheless flourishing. Then the Europeans come in and they divide up this region. The British and the French partition and domination of the modern Arab world during the so-called mandate era, and the mandate just means the idea that the Europeans have mandated themselves have given themselves a task, what they call in the League of Nations, a sacred trust of civilization, to uplift, that was the idea, indigenous populations that were not allegedly capable of uplifting themselves. So that's the whole theory of the mandate, that we're going to help them put into effect self-determination by not allowing them self-determination. So that was what happened. Um, and this sort of partition this last colonialism, this profoundly altered 
the trajectory, the meaning, and the implications of coexistence and the ecumenical frame in the Middle East. For example, whether one identified oneself, whether one identifies oneself as an Arab Christian or as a Christian minority in a Muslim world is profoundly important and salient and relevant until today. Whether one today identifies oneself as an Arab Jew or as a Zionist is also important. Whether one identifies oneself as a Muslim brother or as a secular nationalist or as a communist also is crucial. These are all crucial consequential choices and ideas that remain salient until today. But these choices, whether one identifies oneself as a, an ecumenical Arab Christian or as a Christian minority in the Arab world, these are not predetermined. These, uh, and this point again cannot be emphasized enough, these are not unconstrained by the reality of a new European colonialism where British and French colonialists carved up the Ottoman Empire into separate states. In the book, in fact, I show, and you just look at that picture, you can see it, that's a picture of the creation of Lebanon, where you have the French colonial general right in the middle, separating the Muslim from the Christian. And the idea that the French uh, delivered was exactly what the British also delivered, which is to say, without them, these communities would be at each other's throats and you need the Western man in the middle to separate the antagonistic communities. It's sort of what the Americans have done in Iraq. And the idea is that, that this sort of, this attitude, this colonial attitude had profound consequences, in part of course, because the Arabs themselves were unable to defeat European colonialism, and in part because when you create new states, you create new borders and you create new realities. And so uh, what I try to show in the book is how the advent of political sectarianism in Lebanon in the 1920s, in other words, the straight structure that exists until today in Lebanon, or the secular nationalism of Iraq were competing projects that emerged from an Ottoman soil and then are politicized very differently in the context of the new states that are created by the British and the French after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. In Lebanon, for example, Political sectarianism was elaborated by people who were very close to the French colonial state, by Maronite Christians. And they enshrined this system that exists until today that sort of created what they called a balance of communities, balance of communities which was imbalanced in their favor, but which they said was a necessary step to create an anti-sectarian future. So the irony of the Lebanese political system until today is that theoretically, legally, ideologically, it's, the idea is that we have to recognize religious difference, acknowledge it openly, put it in government, divide government formally along sectarian lines as a way of achieving an anti-sectarian future. In Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, a very different path was taken, which is to say there is religious difference, but we're gonna give it no acknowledgement in the political domain. We're, because we're going to emphasize the secular unity of all citizens. So these are two paths, both emerging from an Ottoman soil, but, in, but sort of uh, both recognizing religious difference, both with their problems, one which was frankly far more secular and Republican ultimately, and the other one far more sectarian, uh, but both coming out of this Ottoman soil and, and sort of, as I said, politicized in different ways. Either way, the Arabs were not free to act alone. They were not, after all, and this is the crucial point to never forget, that neither the Lebanese who elaborate the Lebanese sectarian system, nor the Iraqi nationalists or the Egyptian nationalists or the Syrian nationalists who elaborated a secular nationalist idea, neither of these people were free to act alone. Britain and France are the ones who obsessively demarcated at the same time these regions as places where the European and today, of course, the American was the indispensable arbitrator of allegedly age-old antagonistic sectarian differences. Not surprisingly, therefore, France is, it's not the Lebanese, it's the French who create Lebanon, that state uh, to the north of Israel today. Not because Lebanon is a natural thing, but because the French genuinely believed 
that Muslim and Christian cannot get along in a single state or polity, and that the only way they could get along is with French tutelage. The, Syria, the French also then divide Syria into various Sunni Arab, Alawi, and Druze regions, again, with the same idea, the same conceit, that in France, you can be a, a Protestant, Jewish, a Catholic, and you could be secular in France, but in the East, religious difference inevitably had to be uh, under French tutelage. It's an extraordinary sort of double standard. Um, and the British had the same idea in Iraq and in Egypt. I mean, this was the colonial attitude. And in Palestine, most obviously, British power enabled and protected a new colonizing project known as Zionism to flourish under British protection. And there, this project grew ineg inexorably until the creation of a Jewish state in 1948, which came at the expense of the Palestinian indigenous population. Now, I explain in the book, and I'm ending here, how the advent of colonial Zionism, how the advent of colonial Zionism after 1917 provoked an entirely new conflict between, quote, Arabs and Jews, just at the moment when the great question of Muslim and non-Muslim appeared to be heading towards resolution in the Arab East. Zionism did not, it has to be pointed out, unlike Lebanese sectarianism and unlike the secular nationalisms of Iraq, Syria, Egypt, and so on, Zionism did not spring from the, from the dynamic history of the indigenous Jewish communities of Palestine or of the Jewish communities of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, there were Jewish communities there. Rather, Zionism emerged from the vicissitudes of modern European history and from its, that is to say, European history's racism, nationalism, romanticism, and colonialism. As the historian Karl Schorowski noted in his famous book, Fan des Siecle Vienna, Theodor Herzl's Zionism constituted a secessionist movement from the broken promise of the Enlightenment. It was a form, that is to say Zionism, of European nationalism in the sharper key that was both haunted by European anti-Semitism and entitled by European colonialism. The Zionist movement in Palestine was driven to remake what was until the end of the First World War, and in fact until 1948, a vibrant, pluralist, multi-religious society into a Jewish state, no matter what the indigenous population did or said. Thus, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 that legitimated colonial Zionism in Western eyes contrasted the noble desires of, quote, the Jewish people for a national home. The phrase a national home was in the Balfour Declaration with the less significant existence of, quote, non-Jewish communities who actually lived in Palestine. Thus, a year later in Jerusalem, in 1918, the leading European Zionist of the era, Chaim Weizmann, met with Palestinian Christians and Muslim dignitaries at a dinner hosted by the British military governor of the city. Speaking in English, for Weizmann knew no Arabic, he informed the assembled Muslim and Christian Arabs that he, Weizmann, who was born in Russia and lived in England, was returning home. What he did not say to them explicitly, but what the Zionist movement in Paris in 1919 did say, was that Palestine belonged to the Zionists by virtue of the age-old, in their view, Jewish connection to Palestine that trumped in their eyes the actually indigenous populations, overwhelmingly Muslim and Christian, who lived in Palestine because these indigenous populations were backwards, quote unquote, they were oriental, and because they were not Jewish. Little wonder then, that as deeply an anti-Arab orientalist as Ili Kedouri, who was born to the prosperous Iraqi Jewish community of Baghdad before he moved to London to become a professor of oriental studies, admitted in 1952 that although he had no faith in secular nationalism in the Arab world and in Iraq in particular, he said absolutely no faith in this, it's never going to work. He also confessed that European Zionism did not speak to him or emerge from the Middle Eastern Jewish experience because of course Zionism came from Europe. 
What Kaduri perhaps sensed was that colonial Zionism was profoundly anti-ecumenical. It so exclusively intertwined ideas of religion and ethnicity and nationalism together that it constituted a negation of ecumenical Arabism. It denied, in other words, not only the Arabness of Palestine, it also rejected the possibility and the desirability of being an Arab Jew. Zionism in Palestine was perceived, in other words, by Arabs to be profoundly dangerous, not because, because they saw it as settler colonialism, the term we use today in scholarship, uh, but because they saw it as a sectarian movement that fused religion and nationalism so tightly together that it excluded, by definition, the, the, the indigenous population. How bitterly ironic, therefore, that the Iraqi popular and state reaction to Zionism in the 1940s was to stigmatize and ultimately scapegoat the established and prosperous Iraqi Jewish community of Baghdad as agents of Zionism, and then to hound them out of Iraq in collusion with the new state of Israel that actively fought, as I said, against the idea of being a Jewish Arab, just after the Palestinian Arabs themselves were ethnically cleansed, were removed by Zionist forces during the Nakba of 1948. But how predictable in turn was it that Palestinian Muslim and Christians could and would in fact remake their shattered Palestinian world in exile by both being revolutionaries and by drawing directly on the heritage of the modern ecumenical frame. And how ironic and how beautiful it is today that there are people who are trying to reclaim being Arab Jewish. In other words, saying that there is no contradiction between being an Arab and being a Jew. The larger point, and here I want to conclude, is that as long as European powers held ultimate military power, the Arab imagination of anti-sectarianism remained consistently oppositional and disadvantaged by a nominal or beleaguered sovereignty. The question of Palestine, I think, testifies, testified and still testifies that there was no Arab equivalent to the independence enjoyed by Mustafa Kemal in Turkey, by Ataturk, who defeated the European partition of Turkey and then removed the Greek population of Turkey at least not until the mid-1950s, when revolutions swept away monarchies in Egypt and Iraq. This era of decolonization inaugurated <clears throat> a new chapter in the story of an anti-sectarian ecumenical frame, a story that is simultaneously full of hope and at the same time carrying it within it the seeds of tragedy. <laughs> Whether in Iraq, in Syria, or most famously in Nasser's Egypt, the commitment to anti-sectarianism became and remains an ineluctable aspect of revolutionary mobilization that reshaped the modern Arab world. At the same time, however, the same era witnessed the beginnings of the consistent deployment of the allied tropes of anti-sectarianism and anti-colonialism as part of an arsenal of despotism of national security states that today so disfigure the Middle East, often with US support. What may have begun, in other words, as an ecumenical commitment to combating sectarianism has often degenerated into a debased language of anti-sectarianism that consolidates brutal state power. And that's what we see in Syria and in other parts of the region. We need in the final analysis an honest reckoning with the history of religious difference in the Middle East. But what we do not need anymore is more Western Orientalism that presumes to judge where and how the Arabs and the Muslims allegedly went wrong, nor do we need more, self dis more displays of self-flagellation by any number of disillusioned Arab intellectuals who have lost all faith in the secular pieties that once moved them so deeply. What we need, if anything, is a revitalized criticism of the kind repeatedly called for by the late critic Edward Said, that is to say, to remember that we are not simply trapped in culture, but are actors on culture. One must believe in the possibility of a better society if one has any chance of building such a society. And this holds, I think, as much for the struggle against racism in America today as it does for the struggle against sectarianism in the Middle East. Thank you. That was great. Uh, what we'll do is look at this microphone so you can uh, recognize people, go from one to the other. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Two mic 
Great. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Hi. Very good. Uh, really, uh, congratulations on the book. It's a very challenging topic. I really appreciate your perspectives and uh, very helpful. Um, I like the, the phrase actors on culture you mentioned recently. So I'm a, um, a privileged to be an oil and gas consultant. So I've worked in many countries all over the world, including extensively in Saudi Arabia and in Algeria. So um, I like the concept of coexistence is one that I'm very much keen and want to encourage. There are a couple of things, though, that I saw with my own eyes that I wanted to make sure that you know were tied into so somehow. I worked in Jeddah. Um, which is on the, on the Red Sea coast. I wanted to go to a place called Al Taif, the mountain palace of the of the, of the government. But you, the highway goes through Mecca. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful highway, except there's all these huge signs in every language that says, "Don't think about going into Mecca if you're not uh, a Muslim." Which, mm -hmm. of course, I respected and went around the country, went around. And then I also noticed, of course, the hijab. I see the women in the hijab, and I I, I wonder how that how both of those things either, th those two items, I wonder how, how they sort of flange up with the coexistence concept. And yeah. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. First of all, I mean, it's, I'm glad you reminded me. I, I should mention that in my book, I talk about the Arab East, the Mashriq, and I'm talking about the Arab East, as, which I mentioned, which is Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, um, Egypt, this area, which is known as the Mashriq. I'm not talking about uh, Saudi Arabia or North Africa, because there, there's a totally different history and trajectory. So Saudi Arabia doesn't claim to be, I mean, if your question is like, is, does inequality exist? This is your question. In Saudi Arabia, it absolutely does. But uh, the Saudis, um, you know, of course, don't claim to be a secular democratic state. And so, in other words, the frame doesn't exist there, so it's a different topic, but you're absolutely right. There is oppression there, um, uh, and it's outside the scope of the story that I'm telling in terms of the Arab East. However, having said that, I think it's also important to recognize that what you're saying about Saudi Arabia, in other words, the, the gap between what we would consider to be um, coexistence and the reality um, it is a deeply unhappy one that also exists in every other part of the world, is my point. It's one of the points I'm trying to make. So we could judge the Saudis as as you are, presumably you're judging them as, um, what are you, you're saying there? Well, in particular the hijab. That's yeah, but, the, but the, you shouldn't fix that on the hijab, because the hijab, I think it's best to let Muslim women who wear the hijab uh, judge the hijab and talk about the hijab. Um, and you'll see that many women around the world, many Muslim women around the world, don the hijab for their own reasons. Um, but of course, the ideal situation is that they're given the choice. And when they give them the choice, they do or don't. But rather than sort of judge you know, an entire society or an entire culture on the basis of the hijab, when we don't even know why they wear it. You know, in your case, you certainly don't think you know why they wear it. You're presuming to judge them. But um, and again, the point is to go back to my point. Coexistence, the story of coexistence in the Arab East, I'm talking about specifically the Mashriq, not uh, Saudi Arabia and not North Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dr. Makdusi, in 1860, uh -huh. uh, it wasn't the Muslims that massacred the Christians. Mm -hmm. They were the Druze. Okay. And the ones came to rescue the Christians, they were the Muslims, mm -hmm. under the leadership of a religious leader from Algeria mm -hmm. by the name of Sheikh Abdel Qadir mm -hmm. Al Jazairi, mm -hmm. who, uh, who, who protected those Christians. And, and, uh, and you could verify this, even Abraham Lincoln sent him a, a, some gifts of a couple of uh, rifles mm -hmm. and some other gifts that, that's in the museum in Algeria right now. Mm -hmm. But who is Sheikh Abdel Qadir? He is the one who fought the French when the French invaded and colonized Algeria in 1830. He was captured and eventually uh, taken to France, then exiled, and eventually they led him to go and live in an Arab country, and he went to yes. Damascus. So, but that was it. The Muslims yeah. protected the yeah. Christians. So this is a, you're raising a very important point, and of course I address this in the book. Um, it's not. I mean, what you're saying is 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 like half true. 
Uh, and, um, and again, you could look at the book and read, do the history and you'll see what I'm talking about. In other words, there is no question. It's important, you're raising a very important point about Abdul Qadir. He did in fact protect the Christians, as did many Muslims in Damascus. And I talk about this in the book at length because the whole point is not to talk about Islam being X or Y, but talk about people who in different circumstances act in different ways so that we're not talking about Islam as an essential thing or Muslims as an essential category. There were Muslims who did commit massacres for all sorts of reasons, and there were Muslims who protected Christians, again, including Abdul Qadir, as you point out correctly. And I address this in the book, but I think it's more important for us, honestly, and I appreciate what you're saying and where you're coming from, but honestly, I think it's more important for us to, um, as scholars of the region, as people who care about the region, and in my case, as an Arab from the region, I think it's more important for us to acknowledge and historicize these moments and talk about them rather than engaging in avoidance by saying it's the Druze who did it, which is manifestly um, not the case for Damascus entirely, by no stretch of the imagination. Uh, but thank you. But I, I, appreciate, you, I appreciate the point of Adel Qadr, it's correct. I ask you, why have you... Sorry? I said, why have you dealed off completely about the death and destruction in the Arab world by the Westerners and especially the Americans. Have you made any concessions to Baker Institute? You should not talk about U.S. war crimes. What they have done? No, I'm all for it. No, no, by all means, you can talk. I'm all for talking about U.S. war crimes. I'm, but that's not the subject of my book. But I do talk. I did, in fact, at the end, I did say that the despotisms that today so disfigure the Middle East are, I said mostly, in fact, are almost all backed not all, but almost all backed by the U.S. I mean, so we can talk about that, but that's not the subject of my book, but thank you. I just wanted to say that I very much appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. Because the entire area is extraordinarily complex and interactive, and I've sort of been wandering around it since maybe 65 when I was studying the Aswan Dam and then working for Iraq Petroleum Company, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I love the word modern Arab world. Is there any chance that the people trying to figure out how to run Iraq, or including al-Sadr, are going to be able to read your book and think about how to reconciliate in some form? Well, any Hopefully. more than you know, any more than than you know, people here will be able to read <laughs> books about America and sort of understand that you know, racism and sort of inequality and you know, injustice are ubiquitous around the world. The main difference, of course, is that the Arabs don't act on America in the way that the United States acts on the Arab world. But of course, my hope is that, um, that people in Iraq will read this book in translation or not in translation, um, and people in Lebanon and people in Syria and people in the United States, because in the end, the US is not better in this story than the Arab world. And I think it's important when we're talking about the contemporary Arab world, what the gentleman was talking about earlier, especially after 1967, mm -hmm. the U.S. is utterly implicated in this, in, in the tragedy of what has happened to the story of coexistence in the modern Arab world. But thank you. For well, that. and that coexistence did exist, for example, in Iraq in the 70s. Of course, of course. coexistence. And the only other people you haven't mentioned is the Kurds, who are also part of the equation. Now. Yeah, for sure. Coexistence existed, and coexistence still exists in Iraq mm -hmm. and across the, the region. We just have to be able to, as I said at the beginning, open our eyes and our hearts to this reality and understand that it's complex and contested there as here. That's, that's the difference. But thank you. I thank appreciate you again it. for Thank your you so much. Yes, um, I grew up in Spain, and um, in the year 1190, King Alfonso VII of Castile called himself the, the king of the three religions. Uh -huh. Yet 200 years later, began these terrible pogroms against the Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And historians disagree, but m many of us think that the real reason was economic, because the Jews had been named to be money lenders. Also, they were the tax collectors for the crown. And this incited eventually the hatred of, of the population and, of course, led to eventually the creation of a national a sectarian Catholic country and empire such as Spain was. And my question to you is, you've explained all of this in ideological and, and political terms. Isn't it really economic? I mean, what it's we're talking about here is about 
the fight between the various groups for the preferments that are given within a given system. You mentioned the riots in Damascus in 1860. And, and let's face it, the Israeli-Palestinian question is an issue of land. Well, and it's, it's also an issue, well, the, uh, I mean, it's an issue, issue of, of land, it's an issue of ideology, it's an issue of colonialism, it's an issue of politics, it's an issue of religion, it, it's an issue of all sorts of things. But, yes. but, eventually, but, but eventually, when you go down to it, it's about who has what. And I think the, the, the problem, of course, this has been ex exacerbated, like, for example, um, the colonial powers, whether they were French or, or, or Spanish, or, or their, their uh, idea has been to divide and rule. Correct. And that was what the French did and the English did. Correct. And we do, do we do the same thing? Correct. So I just wonder if maybe economics doesn't create, create maybe a better, a bigger part of it than you, no, it's, than it's, you, than you give it credit for. No, I give it credit, and I talk about well, it in I the book. Well, I haven't read the books. So yeah, know, so if you read the book, you'll see that I, <laughs> I do actually, no, there is, of course, there is an economic dimension, but I think it's also important not to over-determine the economic dimension, because then we miss what people do, what, you know, culture is, you know, and, and will, and all sorts of other factors, um, um, commitment, and so on that you know you could of course you can't deny the economic factors and the political factors and the legal factors again to go back to the idea of a frame you need the framework is absolutely crucial within which people operate in constrained circumstances but i think it's important to understand that people still have the power and the will to act thank you but thank you one more question when uh, when we think about or talk about the Middle East today or the Arab world, mm -hmm. we're always talking about it in terms of Shiite versus Sunni. Well, you never mentioned that one time in your talk, so thank where does that, how does that all fit in? Because well, that's our yes. perception. Well, thank yeah, but thank you for that question. I mean, it's a, that's precisely what I'm trying to push back against. You, I mean, I don't, I'm not, when you said we, I'm not sure who the we is, but uh, the problem, if you think of the Arab world only in terms of Sunni and Shiite, it's, like, it, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of thinking of the United States, which you presumably know more than the Arab world, as only black or white, and that's it. And there's nothing else. And it's not to deny, of course, that there are Sunnis or Shias in the Arab world, but the reality is, if you just think about it objectively for a moment, in the 19th century, the great question was not Sunni versus Shia, it was in terms of the Eastern question, it was Muslim, non-Muslim, and the whole question of the reformation of the empire. Then in the 20th century, the early 20th century, as I explained with the emergence of Zionism in Palestine, there was this new question of Arab versus Jew. So we went from Muslim to non, Muslim versus non-Muslim to Arab versus Jew, and today, and really we can date it with, with some either 1979 or 2003, the US invasion of Iraq, you, we talk about Sunni and Shia. And my point is, these are extraordinarily simplistic and ultimately dehumanizing ways of talking about a place of profound history and culture and, as I've tried to explain, uh, ecumenical compatriotship. So if you want to reduce the Middle East to Sunni and Shia, you're reducing it to an extraordinarily narrow understanding that ignores culture politics, economics, um, will, uh, and coexistence. It's so much richer than that, and you really, you end up with a much more myopic view of a much richer place. Just as I would say you would do the same if you looked at your own society and try to appreciate how rich this society is, despite Trump, that this is an extraordinarily rich society with all sorts of complexities that should not be reduced to a simple binary. And I think that's the issue that we face when we talk about the Arab world. Do not think of it only as Sunni and Shia, because why don't we respect how Arabs themselves talk and think and narrate their history, rather than what we want to think about them. That's what I'm trying to, um, trying to make, uh, make my readers understand. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you.